Okay, thank you very much. So since this is my last lecture, I have to get a little bit worried now that I finish at least the subject that I wanted to cover, which is the quantization of the bosonic string. So let me start. I hope I don't rush too much. Stop me if I really rush too much. I will leave, again, intermediate steps um, for calculations for you to do on your own. I will write down the solutions for you. I will probably distribute them on Friday or on Monday. So let me give you a reminder. And my end goal will be to show you how actually we can quantize the bosonic string. And once we get to the superstring, which I will not be able to cover, you just have to take into account that your spectrum contains bosons and fermions. But I hope that what I've shown you so far, and plus the colloquium that Clifford is going to give you today, which will kind of motivate you a little bit to get through the whole formalism of string theory because it's a very beautiful theory. So let me remind you quickly what we discussed yesterday. So yesterday we wanted to start a really concrete way of quantizing the bosonic string. In first quantization. So remember that we use then the analogy to the point particle. What you do in first quantization is you compute the Feynman path integral. So we use an analogy to the point particle. And if you would like to describe the quantum mechanical motion of a particle from a point xi at a time ti, to a point xf at the time tf, what we basically do is we compute the amplitude for such a motion, which is a path integral, which I've been told you learned already in quantum mechanics. So we've got our path integral here, or generalized x of ti equal to xi, x of tau f equal to xf. We've got an integral over all possible passes. And we've got an e to the i s of x divided by h bar. So the main goal of yesterday was to compute this form of the action. And the way we computed the form of the action was by using a principle which is reparameterization invariance of the action and using an analogy to the point particle. Remember that for the point particle, the only reparameter massive point particle, the only reparameterization invariant quantity was the line element. So that reparameterization invariant, so goal was to compute the action that we need in order to do this path integral here for the case of the bosonic string. So, and the uh, guiding principle was to use reparameterization invariance. I will again close the door if nobody minds. Okay. And what we saw is that for a point particle, the only reparameterization Invariant quantity is S of x. We have got a free constant here, minus m integral over ds. And we saw that we were able to write down this action for an arbitrary background. We can write down this action in the form S of x. So a particle moving in an arbitrary curved background is an integral over the square root of minus g mu nu dx mu dx nu multiplied by d tau, because this is basically our ds square. If I take the square root, I get my ds sitting here. And what we saw is that since this is a point particle, we can describe it just as a function of one motion in terms of one parameter, which is the tau. If we have got a string that moves through space time, we need two parameters. We need a sigma and we need a tau to describe a string. 
the Morse number string because we, the sigma will be describing the point of the string and tau will be describing the motion of the string in time. And in general, we, will be, we were able to describe the action not only for a string, which is uh, one brain. So uh, we introduced the notations that a zero brain is a point particle. And in general, we have got a string, which is a one brain. And we could just easily generalize the action that we wrote down here to the action of a P brain or a P plus one brain. No, a P brain, which, ta which has the P plus one parameters, which takes the following form. So for a P brain, which is a P plus one dimensional extended object, so P space dimensions plus one time dimension, what we saw is the analog of the above action is actually this one here. And you can show us an exercise. And I will show you how this goes. That the action, if I write it in this way here, is reparameterization rem invariant. So a moment ago, I've been asked why there is a determinant there. You will see in a moment why we need a determinant. D alpha of x mu d beta of x mu d p plus 1 of sigma. So what you see, basically, Jack, is that I need a determinant here because I've got loose indices alpha and beta. So this is actually a matrix sitting here. So this is why I need a determinant. And if I go ahead now and evaluate this action for the case, for the case of a string, so you can show, if you would like to, using this precise form of the action and the same guiding principle as for the point particle, that if I write the action in this way here, the action is reparameterization invariant. So let me discuss the symmetries. We, were, we left yesterday with the discussion of the symmetries. So if you write down this action for the case of a string, this alpha and this beta will be running over sigma and tau. And what we saw is that we get, in this case, the so-called Nambugoto action, which is the case p equal to 1, the string. And we saw that just by inserting this determinant, you look at your notes from yesterday, we saw that the action, the number got to action, takes the form S of x is equal to minus t over, no, minus t, the over 2 comes later on, d sigma d tau multiplied by the square root of x dot square x prime square, I tell you, I remind you in a moment what the dot and the prime means, x dot times x prime square. So where, remember what we said yesterday is that this dot here means, whoops, you see, there we go again. <laughs> okay, so what I did basically, I omitted the indices mu and nu for simplicity, so the indices that you see here, I'm just dropping them, but in principle, you've got here indices mu and nu sitting here. The dot, remember, what it meant was the derivative of dx with respect to tau, and the prime means the derivative of dx. Let me put the indices here so that there is no confusion, dx with respect to sigma. So what we then showed is, what we then saw is that this action it's actually really difficult to quantize because we have got the square root here. So our guiding principle was to find an action that doesn't contain a square root and that gives us very easy equations of motion that will then remind us to the action, to the motion or to the quantization of the harmonic oscillator. So what we did is to introduce an additional action that is equivalent to, I don't need to erase here, that is equivalent to the Nambugoto action at the classical level, which means by using equations of motion, so equivalent action was the Polyakov action. Hmm. 
Well, remember what we introduced was an auxiliary wall sheet metric. We call this wall sheet metric H alpha of beta, and it's called wall sheet metric because it depends on sigma and it depends on tau. It doesn't depend on the spacetime coordinates, x, but it depends on sigma and tau, where this index alpha and beta runs over sigma and tau. And what we saw is that the concrete form of the Polyakov action, which by taking the equation of motion of H is equivalent to the number Goto action, takes the following form. S is equal to minus T over 2 multiplied by integral into sigma multiplied by square root of H. H, remember, was the determinant of this metric here. H alpha beta, which was the inverse of the metric H alpha beta with indices down that I introduced there, g mu of x, so I'm in good shape here already because there is no square root appearing here. d alpha of x mu, d beta of x mu. And if I go ahead and compute the equation of motion of this action, so which means I take the variation of this action with respect to h alpha beta, I set this equal to zero, we can show that this is equivalent to the Nambugoto action. So both actions are equivalent at the classical level, but when I now go to the quantum theory, what I will do is I will take the Polyakov action in order to quantize my theory because it's way easier. Are there any questions regarding the lecture of yesterday? Okay. So then let me um, go ahead where we left our discussion of yesterday. We saw that this action has a couple of symmetries, and some of the symmetries will allow us to simplify this action even further. So we saw the action, first of all, is equivalent is Poincare invariant. Which means I can go ahead and go with my x mu to an a mu nu x mu plus b mu, where these are just constants. And the action is invariant under a transformation like this. Fine. So you just insert for your action, you go ahead, replace in your action that you've got here, you go ahead and replace it with an object like this, and you see that the action is invariant. I will write down, so let's leave it this as an exercise, and I will write down the solution for you to see if we understand this. What we also saw is, and now here comes the important point, is that this action is also reparametrization invariant. which means I can go ahead and send my sigma to a new function, sigma tilde of sigma. I can go ahead and send my tau to a new function, tau tilde of tau. And what we see is that the action takes the same form in terms of the coordinates tilde as in terms of the coordinates without the tildes. So let me write down what reparametrization invariance means. Reparametrization invariance means the action takes the same form in no matter what coordinates you choose. as it should actually be. So what we know, what we know is that since, 
since we have got, for the case of the string, remember that we have got components for the metric of the string. Yesterday I called them H11, H12, so let me call them today just use annotation like this, H sigma tau, H tau sigma, and H tau tau. So what we see is that for the case, for the case of the string, what we actually have got is three independent components of the metric because this object here is symmetric. So we've got one, two, and three components of the metric. which means by using this reparameterization invariance, I can choose my favorite metric for two of these components, the easiest one I want, because the action will not depend on them. So I will go ahead and choose flat Minkowski metric for this object here. I will see there's one symmetry left that I didn't, to this, get, didn't get to discuss yesterday. So, and then I can choose for all the metric that I've got here, just a flat Minkowski metric, which is very important because then my equations of motion become very easy. So let me write down the last. So at this moment, I'm easy. What the notion that you usually use is you say you can gauge away, gauge away two components of the metric. Because for the case of the string, what I've got is two reparameterizations. So I choose my favorite form of the metric for two of the coordinates. And since I'm lucky and I've got one more symmetry for the case of the string that I will also leave as a, as a homework exercise, there's one more symmetry that only holds for the case of the string. So only for the string, but not for the pea brain. What you can actually show is that the action is invariant under so-called binary scalings. So trust me on this one, and I will show you how the solution looks like. So what you can see is that if I send my metric, binary scaling means that if I send my metric H alpha beta, So an arbitrary function, lambda, that depends on sigma and tau times i h alpha beta, the action will be invariant. So what does this mean? I've got three symmetries. I've got two reparameterization symmetries. I've got one vial rescaling that we will leave as an exercise, or oh, I wrote it down already here, we will leave this as an exercise to show that the action is invariant under a transformation like this. Which means, since I've got three independent components, I can choose my favorite metric. And the metric that I'm going to choose is flat Minkowski metric. So the action are very easy, so I end up with using the symmetries, using these three symmetries, I get a very easy action. Basically, I've got the action for a free boson, which gives me the equation of motion that we will see in a moment. S is equal to minus T over 2. So here we go. I choose my favorite metric, flat Minkowski metric. No longer an H, there's just an eta appearing here. The alpha of X mu multiplied by the beta of X mu. So let me, in order to emphasize this, let me write this down. So my eta alpha beta is equal to minus 1, 1, and it has got zeros over here. Okay? Any questions on this?
Okay. Either everything is clear or everything is unclear, since you are so quiet. Okay, I hope you are still following. So, in case that I'm going too fast, please tell me, and then I will slow down a little. So, what we see from this action is, of course, that the equation of motion that we get is the wave equation. So, from this action here, we simply get our wave equation, the alpha, the alpha of x mu is equal to zero. So, people, since people don't like the index con contraction that I'm writing down there, so what we end up is with an equation of motion which tells us that I take the second derivative with respect to sigma square minus the second derivative with respect to tau square acting on x mu is equal to zero. So this is basically the equation of motion for a free boson, free massless boson. And at this point, we say, wow, we know how to quantize a free massless boson. We now go ahead, look for the solutions to the equation of motion, but we still have to take one point into account, which is we have to take into account boundary conditions. So let me go ahead and tell you what the boundary conditions is, are. So we need to look, so our goal is to look for a solution to this equation of motion that respects boundary conditions. We can have either open or closed strings. So we will discuss what type of boundary conditions we have. And once we have got the classical solution in terms of the mode expansion, we go ahead and convert these modes into operators, which will satisfy some commutation relations. And we are on our way of constructing the spectrum. So what we see, so let me discuss the subject of boundary conditions. So boundary conditions. What I will do is I will go, I will put several statements just into the air, and if there is time left, I will go back and show you several steps if I've got time at the end, how to actually show this. Otherwise, I will just write it down in terms of notes. So if we take a variation of the action, x mu, that goes to x mu plus delta of x mu. So we just take a variation of this here. Of, we send our coordinate x mu into our x mu plus delta of x mu. What we see is, like in classical mechanics, you look uh, into Landau Lifshitz. Like in classical mechanics, look into the classical mechanics book. When you try to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations, so let me leave this as a hint for the exercise. I can be more explicit later on. What you get is a boundary term. So you get not only the equation of motion, which is the Euler-Lagrange equation, but because in between, in order to, for the action, so the action has to be invariant. So the guiding principle is basically that the action has to be invariant under this transformation here. And what you get from here by demanding, demanding that, let me call this one and two, demanding that two, demanding two, after performing one, we get the equations of motion. So EMO means equations of motion, which are the Euler-Lagrange equations plus a boundary term. And the boundary term takes the following form, minus the integral of d sigma of x mu, I have a variation, delta of x mu, d tau, at the boundaries where I've performed, whoops, at the boundaries of the string, which are sigma equal to zero, sigma equal to two pi. 
And since what we would like to have is for the action to be invariant, so delta S has to be equal to zero under a transformation like this, it means that this boundary term for the action to be invariant has to vanish. Okay? And we can make this boundary term vanish in several different ways. And the several different ways will give us several different types of boundary conditions. First of all, we can have closed strings. So several types of boundary conditions. Let me just say BC, our boundary condition. Several types of boundary conditions for star to vanish. So let me call this star. Okay. So what we can have? the following. First of all, I can just easily go ahead and identify. Take a closed string where I identify, where I go ahead and identify this point sigma equal to zero with a point sigma equal to two pi. And then of course, since sigma equal to zero, sigma equal to two pi are identified, this object here of course vanishes. Because what I'm basically doing is I take, what this means is I take this object here at sigma equal to pi, and then subtract the value of this integrand here at sigma equal to zero. However, if I identify both points, of course, I'm extracting one expression minus the same expression, which means it vanishes. So, we have got, first of all, one boundary condition is I take the closed string, where I basically go ahead and identify x mu of sigma equal to zero with x mu of sigma equal to two pi, or equivalently, sigma under sigma under a shift of two pi, we've got sigma goes to sigma plus two pi. We've got that the fields have to be identified, which means that star in this case vanishes. And this is basically called a closed string, which is the thing that we've got basically here. But we can have also open strings. And we can have open strings with two different types of boundary conditions. So open strings, remember we discussed this at the beginning of the class. So we have got here sigma equal to zero. We have got here sigma equal to two pi. And we can have, while a closed string is in a big like this, And what we can have for the open string is we can have two types of boundary conditions. We can have either Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, depending whether we would like to make the momentum vanish, we hold the coordinate x at the boundary is fixed, or we hold the momentum fixed. So let me write this down a little bit more slowly. So we can have, first of all, so-called Neumann boundary conditions. So what we do there is we say that d sigma of x mu is equal to zero, is equal to zero at sigma equal to zero and two pi, which means I take, I hold basically this derivative fixed. This derivative is basically the momentum. So if I hold this fixed, the moment I set here, the d sigma at two pi, this object vanishes. I subtract the d sigma of x mu 
at sigma equal to zero, it vanishes. So a boundary condition like this makes star vanish. But there's also another type of boundary conditions. And depending, as, I, as we will see later on, depending what type of boundary conditions we choose, we will get different types of elementary particles later on when we compute our spectrum. So that's the point where the boundary conditions enter. So let me take the last boundary condition for, it's again an open string, which is the Dirichlet boundary condition. What we do for the Dirichlet boundary condition is we go ahead and hold the, the ends of the string picks at the point sigma equal to zero and sigma equal to two pi. So what I do is I set this equal to a constant, x mu, let me call this x zero, x zero mu. So this is a constant. And let me hold the other end fixed as well. X mu at 2 pi. So what I mean is here, of course, sigma equal to 0 and sigma equal to 2 pi. So I would like to hold this fixed as well. So I put it equal to a constant. So this is are just two constants. So what happens then, the moment I choose this as two constants, what I see is since x mu is a constant, its derivative, first of all, will vanish. So at the point to pi, it will vanish because the x mu is a constant. Also, its variation will vanish because it's a constant. So again, a boundary condition like this where I hold both ends of the string fixed will make the boundary term vanish. So this will make the boundary term So was this clear? Yes. For boundary condition, sigma should go from zero to pi, not to pi. From zero, I was identifying both points of the string. So that, can you speak a little louder? We work in bosonic. Uh, we are working in the bosonic case, yes. You can choose. It's sigma is okay. You can. It's more or less a matter of convention whether you would like to go because it's not a parameter that is of physical significance. You can restrict yourself to um, a sigma that goes from zero to to pi. So it, it, does, it does not have any significance at all, this parameter, physical significance. OK? So it's a matter more or less of convention. All right? OK, so yes? The constants, so yes, the constants x dot mu are just constant in sigma, right? They could still, still depend on tau. They could still depend on tau, yes. Absolutely good. Good point, okay. All right, so. Mm -hmm. and, and about the difference of boundary conditions, um, the endpoints are fixed or are fixed? At one point, I take the derivatives fixed at the, at the end point, just the derivatives. At the other one, I take the coordinate fixed at the end. Oh, for this, no. For this, you just fix the derivative of x mu at both ends of the string. For this one here, you fix both ends of the string to a constant. You hold them fixed, and you see then the boundary term just vanishes. Because if you take this as a constant, then taking the derivative with respect to sigma makes it just vanish. OK? So what, what we can do is now, now that we have got 
One, our equation of motion. Two, our boundary conditions. What we can do is to look for a solution to our wave equation that takes our boundary conditions into account. So our goal is look, look for a solution to our wave equation. Remember our equation that we write d2 d sigma square minus d tau square acting on x mu equal to zero. That respects our boundary conditions. And in order to do so, let me start discussing first the simple case of the closed string. We can later on discuss how the open string looks like. So let me start by discussing the case of the closed string. And let me write down this wave equation that we have got here in a little simpler form by introducing so-called light cone coordinates. So my light cone coordinates, let me call them x plus minus are equal to one half, one half tau plus minus sigma. Okay, so don't confuse this x that I'm introducing here with the x that I had previously. It's a different x. Maybe I should call it small x. Let's call it small x. It, does ha it doesn't have to do anything with the, with the space-time coordinates. So it's a linear combination of both world sheet coordinates. So if I use this, are uh, the so-called light cone coordinates. What you can do is, in a very easy way, you just make a change of coordinates in the above equation, is to show that the wave equation takes an even simpler form. It takes a form that is the following, d plus, d minus, acting on x mu, is equal to zero. What I mean with this, is that I take the derivative with respect to x plus, then I take the derivative with respect to x minus. Oh, now I'm using, you see, now I'm confusing both x's. So let me put a small x, x plus, x minus, acting on my big x mu, and I see that this is equal to zero. Okay? So, or I can use, so let me just use the notation d plus minus is equal to, so it's a notation that is very conventional, d plus minus plus minus d sigma. Why is this so easy? Because what I see from here, from this equation, is that my big space-time coordinates, x mu, will be, will solve the wave equation if they are only functions of x plus, or if they are functions, it's a sum of a function that only depends on x plus, plus a sum of a function that only depends on x minus, because of the following. So let me write down the solution for you. So the general solution, the most general solution to an equation like this, is the following. So you write down your x mu. That will depend on both coordinates, sigma and tau. And it will be on xr of mu. R stands, we usually call them right movers. It's a function that depends on what I called x minus plus a function xl mu that depends on x plus. So why is this so? Because if I now go ahead, take this function here, I act on this function, 
first of all, with y x minus, what I see is this term here is gone. I go ahead then, and on this function, I act on with the x plus, and I see the other term is gone, which means it's, you easily see it's a solution to the wave equation. So the question, so these are, we usually call them, so it's conventional to call them right movers. So you get accustomed a little bit to the notation, right movers. And these are called the left movers. Question is, how do the right movers and the left movers look like? So right now, we are looking for what I've written down is the solution to the equation of motion. But as I said, we need to take several things into account. So what are we looking for? So we are looking for, first of all, a solution. So what are we looking for? Let me write this down here. First of all, we are looking for a solution that takes the form 1. That is the sum of a left mover and a right mover. So first, a solution of the form 1. Second, we would like to have a solution that satisfies that it has to be real. Third, what we would like to have is a solution that satisfies our boundary conditions. That remember, we're telling us that x mu of sigma x mu of sigma, or let me write it this way, x mu of sigma tau is equal to x mu of sigma plus 2 pi tau, our closed boundary conditions. So what we can easily check is that a solution that satisfies these conditions here is the following. So let me write down first the solution for the right movers, xr of mu takes the following form. One half of x mu. Now I've got too many x's here, but okay, hopefully you will be able to distinguish. I tell you in a moment what all these constants here are. Let me call this, maybe I should call this psi mu. Let me call this psi mu so that, so that there is no confusion later on. Ls square multiplied by pi mu, tau minus sigma, tau minus sigma plus i over 2 multiplied by ls. I tell you what ls is in a moment. It's connected to the string tangent that we introduced a moment ago. And here we go. Here we see already modes arriving. Let me write down this e, this exponential comes here, so let me write it down here. So what do, first of all, what do this, these objects here are constant. The psi and the p, um, p mu are constants. What do they describe? What this describes is the motion, the motion of the center of mass of the string. So this, or let me say, not the motion of the center of the mass. What it describes is the point, the starting point, so to say, of the motion of the center of mass. So it describes the initial position. of the center of mass
And this is the momentum of the center of mass. So what we basically are doing here is the following. What we see here is, first of all, I've got here a point. I start here in a point in space, which this point in space will be described by this psi mu here. Then I go with the center of mass with a momentum through my space. What I see here is I've got some oscillators. So what the oscillators will be telling me is how this object starts vibrating. So I've got a vibrating object that moves through space-time. So this is basically what I can describe with a function that looks in this way here. And I've written down the solution for the right movers. In a similar way, we can write down the solution for the left movers because remember, we need both. We need right movers and we need left movers in order for, for us to have the complete solution. So the left movers basically look in a very similar way. Or maybe I've, I forgot to tell you one thing, which is I didn't define for you what this LS is, which is the fundamental string length. And it's basically just related to the string tangent. So string theorists usually like to introduce many constants, but all of them are related to each other. So, so LS, LS is the so-called fundamental string length. And basically, LS is just related to the quantity that we had before, a factor 1 over pi times the tangent. Let me write down for you. Yes? Uh, of course. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, so when you when you have them oscillating, mm -hmm. that spring there's two there's two oscillation modes. There's longitudinal mode and there's transverse modes. Which other ones are that get excited from the spring? Longitudinal and transverse modes. Right. So if you take the, the spring and you yeah. compress it longitudinal, you get longitudinal like that uh, oscillation, right? And you I, get that in, in a fundamental spring as well. Wait, wait I I was just describing. Oscillations in the so which oscillations? Yes. Oh, you. Oh, 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 oh! I see what you're saying. You're saying making that, that. something like this. That's right. Something like this. Um, so the question is, what happens in the spring? Both one, the other one. Uh, I think you have got. Um, let me let me think for a second. Let me think for a second. Um, what we are describing here. Let me just think for a moment. Longitudinal. I think we are describing the moment. I believe what the answer to your question is the moment that I'm adding both the left movers and the right movers. At that point, I can describe oscillations in one direction and in the other direction. That's what I believe is the answer to your question. Yes? Yes. The excitations in the spring are this way in both, yes. both cases, both left and right. And if you add them, so, so longitudinal oscillation would be the compression of the. Yeah, it doesn't come up here because of the compressive translation of the units. So wouldn't longitudinal oscillations affect the tension and that's the fundamental length of the string? Mm -hmm. So it would depend on the longitudinal exactly. Yeah, it should be. Of reparameter invariants, you say. Oh, which is the reason why? Which is the reason why the parameter sigma is kind of a conventional parameter? Okay, okay, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, that helps. Okay, thanks. Okay, so what um, I was going to say is, let me write down quickly the same. Or yes. Wait. Let me. Let me just. Oh. We have got just oscillation. So the, the question was whether we had oscillations in this way and whether we had oscillations in this way. The answer is we have only oscillations in this way here because 
oscillations in this way here are just gone because of rare parameterization variance. They're, they're just not there. It's a symmetry of the string. It's the, it's the basic reason why I can say I restrict my parameter sigma to be from 0 to, to pi or to pi or whatever I would like to. It, the length the pe doesn't, it doesn't affect anything. It's, it's invariant under this. Well, let me let me get that. Part. Uh, yeah, 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 both. Okay, so let me. Why don't I just write down? Was there another question? Yes. Um, are we still dealing with free massless bosons? Uh, yes. Yes. What would the definition of center of mass then be? Is that more? It's the center of mass of the string. So the string is mass. Say that again? So the string has a mass. Well, it's the center of, yeah, well, the center of mass of the, yeah, imagine more or less in this way, yeah. So it's a kind of the center of mass of the, an extended object has got a center of mass, so to say. Okay, and then that mass, string of mass then goes to create a massless boson. Or is mass sort of more just a conceptual way of thinking of the structure of let me let me let me say it in this way. It's kind of the point, the initial point of motion. You can always have a point. So the way to imagine this, in an easy way to imagine this, it's this psi mu. What it basically defines is the point where the string starts to move. Imagine this just in this way. In a naive way, where do, does my motion start? So if you have got a point-like particle, you have got, of course, it moves with a momentum. It moves with an initial position. So what this psi mu let me define it just in this way, is it defines the initial position of the string. Let's leave it that way. So, what is the position uh, L and N? Uh, these are the modes, modes. These are basically the modes of the string. So these are the modes. Like the modes that we know for the harmonic oscillator. You know when you write down the harmonic oscillator, you can write this in terms of raising and lowering operators. We will basically see that this object here will play the same role as for the harmonic oscillator. Just what you see is that you are zooming over an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. Okay? Let me, let me to, because I've got just half an hour left, let me just um, put the left movers here in a different color, so le the left movers will basically have got just a plus sign here, and what we've got is a tilde here, and we've got a plus sign here. So this are, is basically the form of the left movers, and the complete uh, x mu is the sum of right and left movers, and these objects here are the same for right and left movers. The same is the same. It's the same of it, yes. Okay. All right, so what once we know oh. So here comes now one important point, which is what we oh, what we see for example. So one thing I should have said is what we see is that um, that um, this expansion here, what we see is, first of all, it satisfies the equation of motion because it depends just on the plus and minus combination that I wrote down a moment ago. We see it satisfies the boundary conditions because if I shift my sigma to sigma plus 2 pi, we know that sigma is equal to sigma plus 2 pi, so this term is invariant. The first term is a constant, and we see this exponential here is also invariant under a shift of sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi. So what we see is that this form of xr and xl, xr, l, satisfies boundary condition, and the equation of motion. 
The other condition that I wrote down there is that the object has to be real. The fact that it has to be real means that the modes, you see here I've got positive and negative modes. I can tell you what the alpha zero is in a moment. You see I excluded here the mode alpha zero, which is basically related to the P that I've got here. So what I've got here is a sum over an infinite number of modes, which are, I've got an index that can be positive and negative. So the n runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So in order for my field to be real, what I do is I define the conjugate momentum when, when I got an index with a minus sign down there. I define my conjugate momentum. So for the field to be real, <coughs> we define alpha minus a nu as alpha n star mu. Which is the adjoint of alpha n mu. So it's basically the complex conjugate, which means since I'm zooming here over complex conjugates, so I'm dealing here with pluses and minuses, which means this expression here is then real. And the same, of course, the same, of course, for the other modes for the left mover, so let me, in order to save time, write down the same holds for the left mover, so the same holds for the modes with the tilde on them. And I forgot to tell you one, one last mode here, which is the mode alpha zero, which in order to have a nice algebra is related, so the mode alpha zero From the algebra, we see that alpha zero is basically related by definition to the pi mu that I've got there. It's one half ls. Oops. And of course, the same thing, the same thing if I've got a tilde here. So with and without tilde, it's defined in this way. All right, so once we, have got, once we have got our modes, what we can do is like, like you know for the harmonic oscillator, once we have got our field expanded in terms of modes, we know that we can demand classically, I'm still at the classical level, we can demand that this mode satisfies some Poisson brackets. And when I go to the quantum theory, what I do is that this Poisson brackets become commutators. So let's go ahead and try to quantize our theory. What we can easily check, what we can easily check is that we can demand for this operators, well there are still operators for this modes here, we can demand that they satisfy an algebra that looks in the following way. So from, let me see, from P mu, Sigma. So these are the classical Poisson brackets that you knew, that you know from you look in Landau Lipschitz, for example. You know that the classical Poisson brackets are momentum with a coordinate, like in ordinary mechanics, satisfies a Poisson bracket. Oh, let me write down the dependence here. So this will depend on sigma prime and tau. So. PB means Poisson bracket. I'm still at the classical level. And what I will demand is that this is eta mu nu, like you do in classical mechanics, delta of sigma minus sigma prime. So this is the flat metric. So I've got a minus sign here, and depending on how many dimensions you want to be, you've got a one, one, one here. Later on in the quantum theory, you will see 
that this mu and nu runs from 1 to 26 at the quantum level. Okay. So what we can do, what we can do is once we have got this momentum here and we have got our mode expansion for the field that I have written down there as an exercise, what we can easily check, well easily we have to do a little bit of calculation is the following, that our modes will satisfy the following commutation relations. The following, no, let me call it Poisson relations. So in terms of modes, so using the mode expansion, the Poisson brackets for the modes are the following. So. What we see is, let me do this a little bit more quickly because otherwise I won't be able to finish where I wanted to get. This is alpha and mu. Alpha and mu. So, so what this symbol means, it's a delta symbol, which means that this Poisson, that this Poisson bracket is only different from zero when I've got an index m and an index minus m sitting here. Otherwise, the, the operators commute. And the other relation that I didn't tell you is that if I've got an arbitrary mode, let me call it alpha, let me omit the indices, and modes alpha tilde, these modes always commute. Okay? So this is an exercise. I'm afraid I'm leaving you here with many exercises to do. So. All right, so, so what we see, what do we see from here? Does somebody recognize does somebody recognize this algebra here? So what we see here is that we have got an algebra that alpha m with alpha minus m satisfies that it's given by this object here. The answer is yes, we recognize this because it looks like an harmonic oscillator. An infinite number of harmonic oscillators because this M and N run over an infinite number of modes. So this reminds us, this reminds us to the harmonic oscillator. But we have got one problem there. Remember that the harmonic oscillator satisfies that A and a dagger has to be equal to one. And remember that what I said a moment ago is that if I take, so what we see from this algebra there is that alpha m with alpha minus m, alpha minus m, let me write down a mu and a mu here, is equal to, is equal to m multiplied by eta mu nu. So, and remember that I said that if I've got a minus sign sitting here, what this is is basically, so the subject here is basically the dagger. So you see, you see that there is a very close analogy between 
this algebra here for the harmonic oscillator and this algebra here. The only thing that I have to do is I have to redefine in order to absorb this factor of m here, I have to redefine my oscillators, my uh, modes here, alpha with a factor spoiled of m. So let me do that, let me do that, and then we can define raising and lowering operators. We can define then raising and lowering operators that we can use to construct our spectrum. And then we are almost where we would like to be in order to see how the spectrum of the bosonic string looks like. So let me redefine so that the algebra looks more closely to the algebra of the harmonic oscillator. Let me introduce new modes, AM, that are just redefined. AMU equal to 1 over square root of M multiplied by alpha M mu. This will play the role of the lowering operators. Let me put operators here because I'm going for the quantum theory in a moment. And AM mu dagger will be, as for the harmonic oscillator, 1 over square root of m multiplied by alpha minus m mu will be our raising operators. Okay? So, so it's not that difficult, but we have one problem here, namely, Look at this matrix sitting here. If I put here a zero and I put here a zero, what I get here is the first component of the matrix, remember, was a minus plus, 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 plus. So we have got a problem with this minus sign here because this minus sign will give me a tachyon, a tachyon that has got a negative norm state. Let me show you this in more detail. So the zero component, so here's a problem. Mu equal to nu equal to zero gives a state with negative norm. So let me show you this in detail. This is the famous tachyon that you will only be able to eliminate in the quantum, um, in the supersymmetric case where you have bosons and fermions and the tachyonic state, will, you will be able to cancel it. So why do we have a state with negative norm if we have got a minus one sitting there? So we have got an algebra basically that is telling us that AM zero a m zero dagger is equal to just a minute. Yeah. Uh, it's a set with negative norm. Excuse me, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. It's a ghost. Sorry, I, can, I misspoke. Thanks. So a tachyon is a stake with mass square that is negative. M square is negative, but what we have got is a ghost, which is a state that has got negative norm. Thank you, for, I misspoke there. So let me show you why a state that has got an algebra like this has got, why a state like this has got a negative norm. So I've got a state, if I act with A0 dagger on, take, let me take a vacuum state. So what we say, see is that a state like this, so this is the state that is a ghost. So why is the state a ghost? Because I can compute the norm of the state. It's 
So let me compute the norm of the state for you. We just go ahead and multiply out. So let's have a look at the norm, and we will see that the norm of the state is negative. So let me use as an input that if I take 0, the product of 0 with 0 is equal to 1. So what we see, so this is basically the vacuum state. which I can normalize to be equal to 1. So what I see is that if I would like to compute the norm of the state here, what I basically do is I take a 0. So the definition of the norm is I take a 0, I take a 0 dagger, and I take a 0. So this is basically the definition of the norm of the state that I've got here. So what I can do is now I just commute. So I omitted the index m sitting here. You can easily put an m if you would like to. So what, what, I see, what I see here, if I now use this commutation relation that I've got above, what I get is the following. I get a 0. So use, let me put a star here. So let me use the commutation relation star, and what I get that this is equal to minus 1, which is this minus 1 here. Remember that the commutator is just defined as the product this multiplied by this minus the other way around. So I just commute plus A0 multiplied by dagger multiplied by A0 acting on 0. And we know that when the operator is A0 acts on a state 0, this is a lowering operator. When it acts on the vacuum, it annihilates. So what we basically see from here is that we get this minus 1 here multiplied by 0, 0, which is minus 1. So from here we see that this state here has got a negative norm, and we're dealing with a ghost. OK? So, so that is a problem. That is a problem. But we can easily later on solve the problem. When we go to the quantum theory, there are several constraints which will help us to eliminate the ghost. Yeah. States with negative norm? No. It doesn't make sense. It's a, it's a thing with square that has got a, a norm that is negative, so you don't want to have ghosts in your theory. It's a square that is negative. Sure, but well, you can physically. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, so does it make sense to you to have an object? You can call it that way if you would like to. But, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me to have something that if you square it, you get something that is negative. So usually you would like to have, well, you can say it in that way, in a more fancy way, that the, your theory is non-unitary. You are absolutely right, yeah. So. Mm. I have got to go up. I don't. That's if you know you have something that squares to a negative number that's complex. So what's wrong with having complex? Yeah, but usually what you would like to have in order to have a well-defined theory, you would li like to have a theory that has got all states that have a positive norm. A positive, it's a Hilbert space, so to say. That's what you usually also demand in ordinary quantum mechanics. Uh, Always what you try to do is you try to eliminate negative norm states. And in order to eliminate these negative norm states, what you can do is you have to, there are several normal ordering constants which will enter now into our quantum theory, which I'm afraid, um, let me see if I can get to it into the last couple of minutes. So there are normal ordering constants that enter into the quantum theory. There is the space-time dimension, and I will be able to eliminate ghosts and tachyons for a specific value of a normal ordering constant that enters into my algebra and for a specific value of the space-time dimension. So let me see how far I...
All right, so, so let me try to see what, what is, how far I can get in the last 10 minutes. Can somebody quickly help me and erase some, some of the boards? Just, just erase two or three of them. Or better the next one then, so that I can finish what I would like to write. Otherwise, I will spend my time here writing erasing boards. So what we see, what we see is that we have a state with a negative norm. However, however, the state with negative norm, we will be able to eliminate the state of negative norm, as I said a moment ago, when we go to the quantum theory. So, ghosts, ghosts will be gone in the quantum theory. Thank you, I think I'm fine now. Because of the following. Remember that, that, so hopefully, let me see if there's an easy way now to go. There are a couple of pages there left. Okay, so let me, let me try in the last five minutes. Remember, if you go, if you go back and remember what we had um, was an equation of motion. When we introduced the Polyakov action, we had an equation of motion, delta s, dh, alpha, beta, has to be equal to zero, which was equivalent to the vanishing of the energy momentum tensor. So this was the equation of motion for h alpha, beta. What we do basically in the quantum theory is what we demand. So classically, we would demand that. So let me, let me not explain that the other. So we have got only two components. The other one follows from Weil symmetry. So we have got two constraints that are t plus plus and t minus minus that we still didn't take into account. We have been discussing all the time just about the axis, but we also have to take into account a constraint that we had for the classical theory, which was we have to obey the equation of motion for the H. And let me just state it in this way. The equation of motion for the H gives me two constraints that look in this way here, where plus plus means that I'm taking the plus plus component of the energy momentum tensor mi minus minus, so I'm taking now my light con coordinates. And what I can do, what I can do is I can compute, I can compute from this, I can compute easily from this energy momentum tensor, I can go ahead and compute the modes. So let me see how far I get. So the modes of the energy momentum tensor are the so-called Riazor generators. So we can compute the modes. And they are called Virazoro generators. So how do we compute the modes? We just go ahead and multiply. Let me write down in there's a white chalk left. So let me I have to skip a couple of steps here. So let me write down for you how the mod expansion I will write down for you just the end result because otherwise. So we go ahead and compute the modes of the energy momentum tensor in the following way. And 
And I haven't told you that t plus plus and t minus minus, you have to do the calculation in order to see that. So the t plus plus is given by x dot r square. Remember that the dot was the derivative with respect to t. So you have to do an explicit calculation to see that. So if we take now this into account and carry out our integration, and I use that this t minus minus is given by, this t minus minus is given by, did I say plus here? So this is minus. So we use our expansion for xr. So use x dot r. And set it in here, what we see is that the LMs are given by the following sum. So, and this is still at the classical level. So, these are the so called Grasor generators. And the restriction, the restriction, the classical restriction that the energy momentum tensor has to be equal to zero is equivalent classically that LM has to be equal to zero at the classical level. So each of the modes has to be equal to zero. But there is a difference when we go to the quantum theory because in the quantum theory, we would like to apply the LMs to particular states and the only thing that we have to demand then is that the norm, that a specific type of Virasor generators acting on states have to be equal to zero because we will demand that the norm of this operator here, it will, this object here will become operators, has to be equal to zero. I'm sorry that I'm rushing here, but I'm afraid that, that otherwise I will. So let me see how quickly. So we have to be, let me say one thing. So the things that we demand in the classical, so let me, I have to make a big jump here because in two minutes I won't be able. So what we demand in the, what we demand in the quantum theory is the following. We demand that L0 minus 1, so you won't be able to follow this so quickly. This is a constant that follows from normal ordering. So it's a little bit now, now I'm rushing here a little bit. And we demand that the operators, LM, when acting on a state, have to be equal to 0 for M bigger than 0. It has to be, we only have to demand that the operators with m bigger than zero annihilate. These are the so-called physical states. Because we can see that once we compute the norm of the state here, again, in a similar way as we did a moment ago, that if we put here a minus sign, we will get that the norm is equal to zero. So let me, so these are basically the conditions. So these are the conditions that we can use to construct the spectrum of our theory. So let me, in the last 30 seconds, try to show you and restrict myself to the case of the closed string. So this is getting a little bit difficult here. So let me so compute. So use now this condition star here to compute the spectrum of the closed string. So for the closed string, remember, we have got two sets of operators. We have got operators, so we have basically a product. So we have got an 
a tilde here. We have got operators with a tilde. We have got operators who have left movers, and we have got right movers. And we have to take both a direct product of both spaces into account in order to compute the spectrum of physical states. So let me do that and take that into account. So let's start. Let's start by looking at how the mass formula looks like. So let me quickly derive how the mass of a state looks like. Remember that from so the mass of a state. If you remember how the, the wave equation for a massive particle looks like, remember that it was p mu p mu. Remember that this was related to the mode alpha zero. So this was basically, let me omit the constants here, minus alpha zero mu times alpha zero mu. So what you see from here, what you see from here, and you can compute the explicit form of the operator, A0 which is equal to one half multiplied by, you're cutting me? <laughs> oh boy, so how do I finish the spectrum now in five seconds? So that's the question. Oh boy. You, okay. All right, so what we can, okay. So, all right, so, so we can finish this tomorrow, you say? Okay, so if you give me half an hour tomorrow, maybe? This is the last lecture. <laughs> okay, so. So what you can what you can show okay so what you can show is the following that the mass of a state mass square is equal to n plus n tilde I tell you what n and n tilde are in a second maybe you can give me just five more minutes and, and then I will be there near minus two where the n that I have to find here are, is basically so the n is basically the number operator like we know for the harmonic oscillator is the sum from n equal to 1 to infinity. n, a n dagger, multiplied by a n. So it's so to say the number operator. So we can now go ahead, we can now go ahead and compute the, the spectrum of our theory. So let me quickly do that for you. So let's consider the ground state. There is something, first of all, I have to tell you, there is something that is called the level matching condition, which tells you that the n has to be equal to the n tilde. So let me compute the ground state of the theory. for the closed string satisfies that n has to be equal to n tilde has to be equal to zero. And what you see from here, so I'm, I'm basically done in two seconds now. From the, so the excitement comes when we compute now the first level, so First of all, what we see is here we get our tachyonic state because look what happens if I set. So here we get our tachyonic theory. Look what happens if we set n equal to n tilde equal to zero. I get a mass that is squared is minus two. So from here we see we get a state that is the tachyon. which is bad and can only be eliminated in a supersymmetric theory that unfortunately I won't be able to cover. Let's have a look what happens at the first excited level where n is equal to n tilde and is equal to 1. 
So what we basically, the most general state that we can have at the first excited level, we can add, we can either act with an operator. I said we have to make a direct product. Alpha minus, let me first contract this with a zeta mu nu multiplied by alpha minus one mu. Let me call the state just for simplicity phi, it's phi, cross alpha minus one um, mu acting on a state phi. So what do we see from here? We see from here that if I set the n equal to the n tilde equal to one, we get a state which has m equal to zero. Furthermore, so which is already something very nice, and we see that in front of it, we have got an object that has got two indices, a tensor that has got two indices. And if you recall a little bit what you know from either mechanics or from your quantum mechanics lecture, is that an arbitrary tensor can be decomposed, first of all, into a scalar, which for the string case is the so-called dilaton. So at this mass level, we get a scalar. Second, we get a symmetric part. And at this point, you say, wow, it's symmetric. So it has got the properties of a metric, which you know is symmetric under the exchange of mu and nu. So here we go. What we see is we have got a state that is symmetric and has got a mass that is equal to zero that can be identified with the graviton. And you also know, third, that you can decompose your tensor into an anti-symmetric part which we call B mu nu, and which is essentially the generalization of what Tony Z told you in his lectures for the one index object that you see in ordinary electromagnetism, a mu, to an, to an object that has got two indices. So it, it's a, an anti-symmetric object, so if I change the index mu and nu, I get a negative sign here, and it has got a three-form field strength. So these are basically the three states that I get at a level n equal to n tilde equal to one. So let me stop here, and I'm sorry that I didn't get to the supersymmetric theory to show you how the tachyon disappears, and uh, to show you how the tachyon disappears and how in, we need 26 dimensions. So, and that I rushed a little bit at the end, so this is more or less, but I hope that this inspired you a little bit to go slowly through all the material and the colloquium that Clifford is giving today without so many formulas will be useful to inspire you and go for string theory.